find a variety, not just one, but a variety of positions. Because if you look at schools of architecture, you see that they are very much based on certain fixed notions of the departments of architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, like we have them as well. But what we really need is the emphasis and the force on new kinds of formations, new kinds of ideas. Uh, so for example, just not to go off on a tangent, we have a new, um, new program that's called Art, Design and the Public Domain that really looks at the interaction of art and design and its relationship to questions of the urban. This particular project was really looking at the intersection of ecology and urbanism and to ask the question whether instead of a kind of moralistic position in relation to ecology, can we have a situation where our understanding of the contemporary city in relation to environmental issues actually produces new kinds of intellectual projects, new kinds of designs. So we're actually after new kinds of sensibilities, a new aesthetic, and a new ethics of the urban. And with that in mind, the emphasis this morning and, and again this afternoon is to have people from a variety of different positions. We are not looking necessarily for a singular position or for consensus. And this is why I think also your interventions and your participation will be very important and why we want to keep the comments fairly brief. And that's why I have to uh, uh, stop talking. Uh, this is the book that came from that. We have the off-print of uh, my introduction, which is available for anybody who is interested to take it, it's free, that Lars Muller has made for this event. Um, and the book basically had a lot of contributions with the idea that this is both a kind of book that has a consistency of uh, its uh, narration, but it's also a variety of uh, manuals of information that you could refer to if you're dealing with the question of the city. Uh, it was really wonderful to uh, work with my colleague uh, Gary Doherty uh, in making the book. And uh, I don't know if we have an order. We basically are going to go around the table and uh, maybe start uh, with who? Stefano, what do you think? Shall we start with you, Raul? Are you willing to be the first uh, guinea pig arriving? I, people, we, we, also the people who are speaking, most of them were not in the book. So it's not like we're not presenting. So we're actually trying to find fresh voices in relation to the question of the city. So my colleague, Raul Merotra, I will give a little bit of context. He is actually re just recently joined us at, uh, at Harvard. Uh, he has been practicing in India, in Mumbai. For a long time, he continues to practice there, deals with architecture and, and urbanism of the city, but he is our new chair of urban planning and, and design uh, at uh, Harvard. And I was hoping that uh, Rahul will speak a little bit about Mumbai uh, and the idea that, for example, the informal city seems to be such a key part of what is happening in terms of sort of questions of large scale urbanization. Uh, Unless, Stefano, do you want to make some initial comments before Raoul speaks? I think, great. Well, it's, I think you'll die in some minutes because it's really hard to stay here, but anyway. So, uh, basically I think that uh, what uh, Moisen has done with his book is to gather uh, uh, a bunch of different opinions which are all in a way focusing on the notion of sustainability. Or better, uh, all these opinions are trying to compare the notion of sustainability with, with I think, at the moment, one of the most successful and popular world, which is part of our technical language, to compare this notion with the notion of ecology. And that's, I think, is a really crucial point in the discussion that I hope also this afternoon we could uh, we could start here. Uh, uh, what I think personally is that uh, uh, the notion of sustainability is uh, in itself uh, capable to create several paradoxical situations or several paradoxes. Just two years ago, together with the Vitarian magazine, we had an installation here in that white building called Sustainable Dystopias. 
which we are trying to underline some of these paradoxes. We are talking about sustainability and we are planning to fill up our city with uh, technic technical devices, all, everywhere, solar panels, eolic machines, geothermal devices. And we are talking about sustainability with understanding this uh, diffusion, this proliferation of technical devices could produce complicated and problematic situation in our daily life. We are talking about sustainability and then we are thinking to the possibility to reduce the mineral surface in our city, so to, to support the sort of uh, process of demineralization. For instance, introducing agriculture, introducing uh, cultivate green fields in our cities, in the vertical and horizontal surfaces, but also this kind of thing could produce several paradoxes. Like for instance, the fact that uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean countries like Greece or Spain or Italy, we have nowadays many huge, huge, huge uh, fields which are completely covered by solar panels instead of being cultivated by agriculture. Or again, we are talking about sustainability, about the possible relation with the idea of nature. And we don't understand that uh, probably thanks to the extension of our contemporary city, we have now a very difficult relation with uh, what is real nature. We have the animals, other species which are close to us in many different ways. The foxes in London, uh, the pigs in, uh, in Florence, uh, and many other cases where the relation between the human species and the other species has become completely different in the last year. So my point is that this notion of sustainability in itself is uh, capable to generate a lot of paradoxes, but also because in a way it is completely centrated on the human sphere. So he puts the urban sphere, the human sphere on the pedestal, and everything is about this. And uh, if you want, what it tells us is that the more we are capable to become light in our footprint, the more we are sustainable. The more we are able to reduce the footprint of human presence, the more we are sustainable. But uh, what is uh, really interesting for me, and this is, uh, I think, the, the, the effort that the book is doing, uh, that Morrison has, uh, has done, is to try to observe the same kind of phenomena, more or less the same phenomena, from another perspective, using another paradigm, or better, going back to an old paradigm, but uh, using it in a sort of new way, which is a notion of ecology. And from that point of view, I think that uh, what I like of the idea of uh, a new urban ecology is that it, move, it moves the urban sphere from its pedestal. It observes our social environment like a, let me say, a general field where different species and different auto, uh, if you want, social effects and different uh, uh, built environment and settlements are more or less on the same position. Uh, for instance, I think that from going back to the notion of ecology, we can observe much better how the atmosphere, the agricultural sphere, and the natural sphere are playing their role, they game together, how they are changing, how they are producing traditional spaces, and they are continuously fighting one with the other. So what I really appreciate in this uh, effort to switch from sustainability to ecology is this uh, attempt to move our anthropocentric gaze from its pedestal and to try to propose something of different. Raul, it's up to you. No, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, what I'm going to sort of do is just share with you, you know, some observations that become very clear to me because of the schizophrenic uh, existence that I'm sort of experiencing between living in Mumbai and teaching in the US. And I think this is the closest in uh, a long time in the West that I've come close to feeling like I'm in Mumbai because the combination of the heat and the density is uh, fantastic. So I'm feeling very much at home and very comfortable. The water, I'm OK. Uh, and I sort of, first of all, want to start with the, with, with the observation that uh, 
you know, here in the West, we the centripetal forces of urbanism versus the central feudal forces of urbanism, uh, I mean, in India, the centripetal forces have created overwhelming densities, which is exactly the opposite of uh, what the West is doing, which is it's trying to create that compactness. And in India, we are going where you're coming from, and we are trying to uh, put in infrastructure to disperse the population. And I think just to recognize that we are coming from where you're going, and you're going where we are coming from is important, because it's the middle ground, I think, where our solutions lie. And just for a quick statistic, in India, there are about 392 cities or towns, which are about 100,000 people, expected in the next 20 years to become a million people. We're going to have 400 million people living in a rural urban continuum. Uh, and that is where I think with the West, we're going to have some intersections in the kinds of landscapes that we're going to make. And I think, therefore, there's a lot that can go between the North and South. And it's very critical that we set up dialogue such as this. And so what are the questions that sort of come to my mind as a result of those observations which might be useful for this discussion? I think the first is I see that in the West, as opposed to a lot of the South, and unfortunately the South is picking up on this paradigm, is that architecture is too much of the central spectacle of the city. And so when we talk about questions of uh, re-retrofitting our cities, I'm going to avoid using the word sustainability. This might be the only time I use it, and excuse me if I use it, because I think ecological urbanism is a wonderful frame. Uh, which opens up many other possibilities. And so architecture has become overwhelmingly the spectacle. And even the solutions that we're looking at to create a greener world begin to start lying in architecture. And through that, the lead, for me, is a symbol of Western hegemony, because uh, the lead, the whole lead code to me is about mechanical and chemical fixes for mistakes. Uh, because you're caught in the paradigm of architecture being the spectacle, and then you need these fixes, which are invariably mechanical and chemical. And there's a whole industry that develops around it. So this is the first one that I think becomes very, very, very clear to me. The second is that I think there is the emergence uh, of new visions, uh, which are being set up as as binaries. These are new visions of fixity and mobility, uh, with visions of the, of the visible and the invisible, the digital and the analog world, um, uh, the, the tactile and the ephemeral. Uh, and these are all interesting notions. But because we lock our discussions, and the formal and the informal city is a classic one, we lock our discussions into binaries, uh, it's problematic. Because then you can either occupy one or the other space. And again, I think I'm reinforcing the idea of ecology uh, as a notion to grapple with urbanism, because it helps us dissolve these binaries. And so I think this notion uh, that we are caught, or this idea that we are caught in these binaries, and we must recognize it to move forward uh, uh, around these issues, uh, to my mind, is a critical one. We, when, when we speak of ecology or ecological urbanism, I think we imply multiple domains uh, and their seamless and synergetic coexistence. Uh, and so these are domains of water, energy, mobility, urban form, lifestyle, governance. Uh, but again, in our imagination, they are separate. So there's incredible research and discussion about creating new forms of energy. And then there are separate discussions about how that can be distributed. Uh, they're similarly about water, uh, uh, et cetera. And I think this detachment is what creates the landscapes of inequity. Because when you make breakthroughs in the, in the facilitation or creation of these assets, but you cannot address distribution, uh, you create a landscape of inequity. And again, I think uh, looking at this as an ecological system uh, maybe will address and help us uh, collapse uh, that separation between uh, production and, uh, and, and distribution. And that just leads me to my last point, which is uh, I think, uh, it seems to me, the uh, overwhelming use of technology uh, in discussions about the city is, again, problematic and limiting. Uh, because technology is an instrument. Uh, it's a technical instrument to do something. And of course, a lot of uh, uh, solutions lie in technology. A lot of solutions uh, of technology we haven't explored in urbanism are very critical. But I think we need to move our discussion into the scientific uh, approach. Or we should use the word science more than technology. Because science is about a broader body of knowledge, which technology is an instrument within uh, to facilitate. And again, I think uh, y using that idea to understand and clarify the potential of ecological urbanism uh, and ecology as a notion uh, uh, to address these problems would be important. And I think I would just last by say, uh, uh, end by saying is really I think the key question is, how do we urbanize science? How do we make science part of the urban system? Thank you.